Hi everyone. So this is the last one uh, video I'm going to do on the book. Um, if I kept reading, we're barely halfway through. <laughs> so um, we'll do a sort of a sum up just so people understand, you know, those first years, um, you know, the foundation, I guess what I wanted you to realize, the foundation was really uh, the stimulation program and the nutritional program. Those were huge. And, you know, Bree's, Bree wasn't weak in spiritual and emotional. Uh, she was weak in physical, physical and nutritional. I was the one weak in spiritual and emotional, you know, and she came in as a fantastic teacher on that. Uh, I think that first period is the constant struggle uh, for finances, the constant struggle for acceptance, the constant struggle for services. And, you know, when I look back, it took two years oh, with the school system. Once we uh, came to the States, Bree, um, Bree's dad, Walter, was a U.S. citizen. And all the information I was using, you know, for the nutrition came from Boston. Uh, the stimulation came from Philadelphia. So everything, books, everything I was ordering came from the States. So he wasn't liking at that point, you know, he, he wasn't liking being in business. And uh, so uh, we moved to the States and he went back to teaching. And I wasn't sure about that because he used, had talked about how he hated it. But uh, he got a job because of Bree uh, working with special needs kids because he told about the program, which, yeah, he, he's, he did and he didn't. Uh, anyway, uh, it's all fine. I think um, it's just to understand the challenges a parent goes through. You know, Walter is a national sales manager for his company at this point before we move to the States. He travels a great deal and is away many weekends. When he does have time off, he spends it skiing, windsurfing, climbing, or running. We are dealing with Bree's situation very differently. I was reading and studying anything I could find, and my life and outlooks and <clears throat> my life and outlook was changing constantly because of that. Spiritually, I was growing. You know, Bree was just catapulting me into complete change. Uh, when he does spend uh, and and Walter. You know, if I heard of anything new, I felt I must look into it to see if there was something of value for Bree. Whatever I decided <clears throat> doesn't seem to bother Walter as long as he isn't expected to, to do anything about it or be involved. He spends his evening watching TV and drinking beer. He has stopped giving Bree, you know, the attention, you know, and actually pays very little attention to her at this point. We've done the program for two years. And uh, it's coming up to time to, um, uh, you know, at that point, what happened is when I found the diet, it was on one of our last visits to Philadelphia for an update. And, um, you know, the parents talk outside together, you know, during breaks and, you know, what's working for them, what isn't working. Uh, and, um I met one woman, she's passed away since, what a beautiful woman. She had a two-year-old uh, little Down syndrome boy, what a sweet family. And um, she died of kidney cancer. Um, I was connected to them, you know, every Christmas we'd connect and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, she told me, you know, I was struggling with seizures. It, it always felt Brie would advance, but a, a seizure would put her back. You know, she would be doing great, then she'd have a seizure and she would, you know, so it was a constant step forward, step back, step two steps forward, one step back. And um, she told me about a family somewhere in the States who were doing this diet called macrobiotics. And I didn't know anything about it, but that it was working for the seizures. But I was always listening. I was always watching. I was always looking. And I said, well, tell me more. And uh, can I call them? Everything. And then she told me it was out of Philadelphia. No, it was out of Boston. It was out of Boston. And uh, so I started doing research. Uh, what I found out is, you know, I started phoning everywhere. It was just crazy. Uh, 
that's you know to find out i found i phoned boston uh first of all i found someone in in montreal which was 45 minutes from us who could do a consultation with us started there was no internet then everything was phone phones and books and you know i couldn't search something up on amazon and have it ordered there was no such thing as that then so the searching was a very different it's easy compared to today there's like too much information in a way you know because you can be bombarded constantly by uh special free seminars and stuff and now it's a matter of choosing wisely now that's what it is so uh but you know if i had i had uh, documentaries like forks over knives game changers what you know what you eat all those documentaries are fabulous oh my god the support would have been amazing so um so what happened was uh we had been we were in toronto walter was traveling a lot uh and i was basically doing the program so we were living together but he because brie wasn't getting well he had lost interest and it's not that, that I didn't uh, love Walter or care for him, but it was our child and he didn't share. He didn't share interest in, you know, a being that came from both of us. And we had our dog, Sam, who passed away during this time. There were a lot of things. And then um, finally, when he didn't want, we were living in Toronto, he didn't want to do the job anymore. He decided to uh, go and uh, we decided, listen, all the information's coming from the States. Why don't we see? And we'd always loved Vermont. So uh, we'd spent our honeymoon in Vermont. We had really good friends in Vermont. The only friends who, the ones that treated Brie like she was just, she was our child. That was it. There was no strange looks or, uh, you know, uh, they still came to visit. We still visited them. It was fine. So, um so what happened, you know, because there's so much to the story. He found a job in Vermont uh, working as a special uh, needs teacher. And, um, and of course, I was concerned because he always talked about how he hated teaching. Anyway, we found this place. The salary was like half of what he was making. And uh, so we did it. And, you know, the constant struggles. We sold our house. We, we, it took us four years after finishing the stimulation program to pay off uh you know there were bottle drives and uh, you know the one thing that comes out of this is then when we went to vermont and then when i finally decided to leave walter because i was you know living in a house with him but he'd go to work and go to the bar afterwards every night after school he'd go with the teachers to the bar and i'd been with brie all day doing the best stimulation program I could carry on on my own, totally alone. Uh, then I was fighting for minimal services from the school system because I wanted her with her allergies and her seizures to be at home. So, you know, here I was doing everything alone. And uh, uh, I started one day a week, he'd babysit Brie on a Saturday. I started working in a, in a bookstore and uh, with a sort of a metaphysical bookstore with a lot of spiritual healing information coming in. And uh, I, we started going also to, we, 15 summers we went to a Macrobiotic Summer Conference, which was a week, you know, somewhere in the New England area. And Walter, we, Bree and I got in free because he ran the kids program because as a teacher, he ran the kids program, we got in free. So I got to go to lectures, I got to go somewhere where there was actually food that both Brie and I could eat, which is really nice. It was a really nice break. And the community was so accepting of Brie, which is really, uh, that, was, uh, that was a wonderful experience. And I'm connected with many of these people still today. Um, but how I found out about this was, uh, I was phoning, I mean, I was even phoning the U.S. Department of Agriculture trying to find out how many calories were in, you know, sea vegetables because I didn't know anything about nutrition, uh, but I knew it was a doorway and I knew it was important. Uh, so I had a lot to learn. And um, 
when I phoned the head office for uh, Macrobiotics in Boston, the lady that answered the phone, Susan, um, I started asking my typical questions. Do you know any other families doing this diet and da da da? Always looking for someone to connect with to get information. And she said, well, my house mother uh, used to work in Philadelphia. And lo and behold, Mary, who was our counselor for the stimulation program in Philadelphia, had gone to Boston to learn the diet because there were such good results with the special needs kids. So I told her, tell her we're the ski family from Canada. And um, she called back and uh, said, if you can get to Boston, you can stay where we're staying because we're cooking for this lawyer. You can stay with us and uh, I'll teach you. You know, I'll teach you during the day. And why she offered that was she knew we were a family who had done the stimulation for two and a half years. So many don't survive that. So she knew I had my work ethic in place. She knew that if I committed to something, I would follow through. So she wasn't wasting her time on someone because people do that. They, I've had a lot of it. I've you know connected with a lot of families and helped a lot of families out, but most of them wanted me to do the work for them. And they just wanted to take my time. And you know, your time is for your child, it's precious. And if it's not for your child, you're trying to recoup yourself just keep yourself steady and to this day when there's a care situation come up people in this area still think to call me they think me I should be the one I have someone just the email the other day that you know uh, a, a, a friend that I used to know years ago has a 24 year old son who I believe is autistic she's looking for a, a live-in caregiver and it's like no 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 I uh, no I did it I did it, you know. Uh, you know, once someone gave me information that made sense, I pretty much ran with it. They didn't have to hold my hand too much. And even Mary, who was my first nutritional teacher, you know, she, um, you know, she, I could ask her questions, but she knew that I would take it and do something with it. I wasn't wasting her time. So, um, that was, you know, these connections kept coming. And I think it was because that I followed through and I did the work and I, you know, and I didn't, you know, people knew I was serious. I wasn't just, I don't know, trying to make it look like I was interested or something. So um, I had agencies when I was in Canada wanting to bring families to see what we were doing, you know, because the results were good no matter what. You know, Brie became a creeper. That changed her life. And uh, I got her to the point of walking with aid, holding on to me. Uh, but I was alone doing it. I just couldn't, I couldn't hand, handle it. I needed help. Walter wasn't helping. And uh, so I couldn't hang on to it on my own. So when I left him, I was really alone. You know, now I'm starting over. Uh, I ended up uh, living in New Hampshire where I knew nobody had no friends, it was the only door that opened, and it was someone I had met at a macrobiotic summer conference who I ended up living with his mom. And uh, for four months initially, but we got along so well, his mom and I, that we became like mom and daughter. And she was an awesome woman, awesome woman. And so I started making my way in a new state. I, I don't even know how I did this stuff. I have no clue uh, who this woman was. Here I am going from Vermont to New Hampshire with a five by eight trailer, my little, my little hurt daughter with me, going to a place that I didn't know anybody. And, but it was the only door that opened and Walter was wanting me to move out because we had spent a year, you know, separate bedrooms, me with Brie and, um, so I don't know, I, the grace of God, the grace of God, because I have no idea. When I read back to the struggles I had for services, now that's what I think about. It took me two years in New Hampshire with the uh, school and with the school board. I had to go talk in front of them. I had letters from doctors because I wanted an, uh, someone to come into the house for 10 hours a week. That was it. 
they were recommending basically an institution, Crotchet Mountain, which is basically a fancy name for a re rehab center. And, um, and uh, they couldn't understand why I didn't want to send Brie there because it had a pool and computers. Well, she didn't do a computer and the, the pool was toxic to her with the chlorine in it. So um, two years and I finally got the 10 hours a week. Crotchet Mountain back in the day was 125,000 a year. What I was asking for was 15,000. Even financially, it didn't make sense. But you know, everybody has to fit into a box. I was the best deal going. The Health and Human Services, I fought and fought for services. Oh, I could get medications. I could get equipment that I didn't need because I was trained in the stimulation program. Not only that, I'm a trained parent. I've taken, I've been trained up on the brain. I've been trained up on stimulation program. Then I got, in 97, I got qualified in food as a counselor and, and teacher. So now they have this parent that's trained up you know, the best deal going. And I had to fight tooth and nail. I had to go to Health and Human Services twice. And my caseworker, finally they were lying that they had offered me certain things and she knew it. And she just took the whole file and slammed it down on the paper. She said, that's not true. This woman's not getting that. And, um, you know, it's her and I with this table of people. So... You know, that's exhausting. Now, those were the things that were exhausting. You know, Brie was a joy compared to fighting the state, fighting for services, you know, being the, the cheapest option and yet having to fight for services to be the cheapest. They would have paid a stranger like double what they wanted to pay me who's qualified with the stranger just being someone they hired, not qualified, you know, would have paid without question. And I had to fight tooth and nail. And I didn't mind, they came into the house, Health and Human Services, you know, the caseworker came, she took notes the whole time. I was happy she was taking notes. There's nothing I had to hide. You, you couldn't put together what I was doing every day before a, a meeting like that. You know, it was our lifestyle. That's the way we lived. And it and it it it's you know touches my heart that parents must give up because that struggle for just basic human rights, you know, and services is not right. It's not right. You shouldn't have to do that. You know, the strongest civilizations are the ones that look after their elder their elder and their weaker ones. Those are the strongest civilizations not the ones that just uh, warehouse everything that they don't want to deal with in some pretty building with flowers outside. You know, you know whether it's our elders or whether it's our special hurt children, you know, whatever, you know, we like to just warehouse in a pretty building and all these wonderful services, supposedly. Anyway, <laughs> that's, my, that's my little rant on that. But, um, the, what I've learned is just amazing. So what we got to was I made a couple of notes on these last chapters. And uh, I want to... Uh, oh, and here's where I... Uh, uh, there was a woman, the first woman from Health and Human Services. Um, I actually got her before I think she went on to another job. But... Um, you know, she called me and I said, you know, I said I was so frustrated and that, you know, I could get nursing care, I could get medication, I could get equipment, all the things I had worked for 20 years not to need. I told her I needed money to pay our monthly upkeep. I felt I was wasting my time. Either one of us knew how the information about me ended up on her desk, but it turned out somehow my case got on her desk, which is really good. Because this woman took, came and visited, saw what I was doing, took my whole case to her boss and got me into this program that was, it, it was a program that was being phased out. And it's like they slipped me under the door. I was the last one. The grace of God. I mean, really, these miraculous things came from somewhere. And she told me herself, 
my boss, I said, this is being phased out. What's going to happen? And he, she said, my boss, uh, he, uh, Okay, no, my boss has made an exception for you, she said. No one new is being put in this program. So those are the things that just saved us. Another thing that saved us, and I'll, I'll go here to explain it better, because I went to, you know, uh, oh, I remember the file in the hospital early on with Bree early early on when walter her dad got the file he, he to go between appointments but that was a mistake on the nurse's part it said in it that um mother is far too emotional the mother is far too emotional so and but then you know i started thank god i was a reader and i started reading books like by bernie siegel love medicine and miracles and louise hay you know uh, how to heal your life about positive things. Uh, when I when Bree was seven years old, we were in Vermont at this play, at this time. My mother, my mother, she's amazing. She was reading a magazine I'd left at her house, the East West Journal, and she saw an article on crystals. I had no idea crystals. Now I wear one, uh, which was a gift from Marcel Vogel, but. She said, look into this. And I'm, you know, me, I'm focused on food, stimulation, mom. And so um, I said, okay, mom. So I started phoning again, because this was the time when you had to phone. And uh, I connected with Marcel Vogel's office, his research uh, lab in California. And for whatever reason, another miracle, <laughs> he answered the phone. His secretary had gone to lunch and he happened to answer the phone. And I started telling them the story of Bree and, um, you know, what I was doing and everything. And he said, listen, he was Catholic. This was the man whose son was a Catholic priest in the Yukon and he had met Mother Teresa. And he said, well, I've given up sugar for Lent. I'll take you guys on. So for free, he said, call me every Wednesday morning after I've been to mass and we'll do healing over the phone. So he did crystal work over the phone. He will now this was the man who had been a senior scientist with IBM for 27 years and he had done their crystals because there are crystals in computers. He was aging wine with crystals, there was healing done with crystals. It was amazing. But I didn't know. I'm not a, a scientific, you know, I didn't study science. I'm more a social sciences, history, geography, literature. And um but that's who I got to talk to on the phone. And we worked together for four years on the phone every Wednesday after I would call him. It got to be where he was Papa Vogel to me. He was like another father, you know. And um, I was hoping to meet him. I was hoping to go up to Montreal to meet him from Vermont because I knew he was doing um, a seminar and uh, to surprise him. I could stay at my brother's and go to surprise him. And uh, one day when I called on a Wednesday, his uh, son answered and said he had passed away. So I never got to meet him. Hmm. But he, uh, uh, when he, uh, he had told me the, the phone call before. He said, I, you know, I've done all the work that I've come here to do. And I think I had a mini stroke the other day. But I've done all the work I've come here to do. So he's warning me. He's telling me, you know. Anyway, thank God for him. And sometimes he'd hold this 13-sided crystal and he said, working with Brie, and he said it gets so strong, he could barely hold on to it. It was so, so uh, hot. So um, then there's so many things that were going on. I mean, I went to summer conferences. I learned about dowsing. Uh, I learned about uh, allergies and I had Brie's hair tested and found out what she was allergic to. Um, at one point I wanted to have another child. I was looking into international adoption. Walter wasn't interested. Um, and you know what? Then at also, uh, not too many men in Bree's life were paid any attention to her. Her father, you know, once he lost interest, none of my, I have four brothers, 
you know, none of them really paid attention. I mean, one of my brothers, when he came for a visit, Brie was staring at him because she wanted attention. And he was like, well, why is she looking at me? It's like, oh, why not? You know, I mean, she would like attention. She might want to play her cap clapping hands game with him, you know, win. Uh, so it was interesting. She, uh, and someone brought it up. I think it was the dowser, the guy, the dowser guy asked me. Uh, so, you know, that, that's sad. Um, Walter at that point was traveling on the road three, oh, before the school, before the school, working at the school, he was traveling three months a year. So, uh, I was doing a lot on my own. Bree reacted to the heat. Uh, and would have seizures, you know, with not the air moving and stuff. For summer times, I had to really uh, watch that with her. Uh, so then uh, I remember when I finally got to New Hampshire, I'm sort of looking at these notes, wandering around a bit. Uh, a woman who first edited this book, I'm finding some spelling things that went wrong, you know, wrong. Uh, this was edited twice, so and and I couldn't do it. Uh, I was just too emotionally involved. Uh, I'd probably need to read this, all, write it all over again, and and add the last so many things after 21 years old. But Lee Patterson was a writer herself and worked at this institution in Philadelphia, the stimulation program, and she was also a caseworker because we we met a lot of people there. She offered to edit this book the first time, and she lived in Australia, too. And she'd written so many books uh, to raise her own child because her husband in Australia had been killed when she was pregnant with her child. And so this is a woman who wrote books, uh, romantic novels, to uh, support her, and she did really well. Then in later in life, she wrote historical novels. Anyway, another person that came into my life, I phoned her one day and it was, I guess, about sending this to be edited to, to her. And um, I was really depressed. I was living in New Hampshire. I didn't know anybody. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, she said to me, she said, Wendy, I don't know if they still have them, but there used to be these lead bottom balloons. You know, they're about human size and you could punch them. And they'd come back and you could punch them and you'd come back. And she said, I was like that. <laughs> uh, and the harder you punch them, the more they bounce back and, and they could punch you back. You know. So she said, Wendy, you're like um, a lead bottom balloon. You always bounce back. You always bounce back. So um, when I left Walter within a year and a half, he was remarried. Uh, Bree's 16th birthday, you know, Walter comes to visit. He was always welcome in our home. I mean, wherever we were living, I made sure that for 30 years of Bree's life, he got a Father's Day card, Christmas present, birthday card and present. I made sure because Bree couldn't do it. I made sure it was done. I never got anything in return, but I am only responsible for my actions. So I made sure that was done. On her 16th birthday, Walter phones and asks to show up. Like, I'm shocked. Why? You know, I asked him to come on her 21st too, because I had asked other people that had worked with Brian. And, and in a way I wanted him to see that she had such a wonderful community of people around her. Uh, but what I found out was his wife, had been taking a program in Hanover, which is like, at that where we lived then was a hundred, uh, half of a, 30 minutes from where we lived. She'd been doing it for a long time. And that was the final one she did. And he came to Bree's birthday because it was around Bree's birthday. But he never came to any of the others. So um, the only thing that, and I, I, I'm okay with it, but in Bree's life, there were four weekends that I was not with her. Two were my mom, so no problem. Two were, uh, one was with the last two aid supports I had. Two awesome, awesome, awesome women. 
one I had for the last five years of Bree's life. Oh my God, what a woman. <laughs> and um, one weekend with them. One was with Walter. I was petered out. I just needed, I wanted to go to the, the Cushy Institute in Beckett just to chill. <clears throat> and I came back. I had left all Bree's food. I had aid support coming in the day. Basically, all he had to do was make sure she was fed, change her diapers, and be there, you know, because the aid support was there all day. Otherwise, read, watch TV, whatever. I came back, and I didn't find out right away, but I soon found out through that, that woman that stayed with me five years of the aid support that she came in one morning, and Bree hadn't been changed. She was in a nasty diaper, literally had to be bathed. And she had to ask him, you have to help me bathe her. Uh, he, so I wasn't pleased. <laughs> I wasn't pleased. He, he wasn't just basic care. And I had him so set up. That, you know, he didn't have to cook anything or anything. So um, once Bree wrote, got to 17, Walter was legally trying to do everything to get out of any responsibility whatsoever. Um, you know, he didn't want to be involved. He, he thought because she was 17 that he didn't have any responsibilities. You know, he didn't relate that he had never paid for a wedding. He'd never paid for, you know, school or things that kids do at school, all of that stuff. You know, I had basically he was paying for a rental car, uh, you know, so at the, at the very end when, uh, I think I'll wait to tell the, that last story. What I wanted to relate here was, um, so, you know, I learned about allergies. I learned about how food and allergies, it, it was huge that they cause seizure. You know, a single allergen can cause as many as 15 or more reactions from mood swings, itchy and runny noses and eyes, canker sores, migraine, headaches to epileptic seizures. Um, the most frequent allergens responsible for convulsion reactions like epilepsy are found in foods. The most common of these are milk, eggs, wheat, chocolate, beef, pork, veal, and cheese. A report in the December 1951 edition of Modern Medicine by Susan Deeds, MD, and Hans uh, Lowenbach, MD, stated that in a study of 37 children who had either grand mal or petit mal seizures, all allergic symptoms and all seizures were controlled when the foods to which they were allergic were eliminated. How many times did I, you know, people wouldn't believe me because I'd watch it. I'd take out the food that, I'd watch a food like corn summer giving her making this wonderful from scratch cream corn you know and thinking it would be cooling for the summer and her seizure activity would go up or wheat noodles during the summer and her seizure activity and I, then i started putting it together because i had to put this all together doctors don't study nutrition it's just they don't they study surgery and medications and how to prescribe medications so there are there are now, I mean, I, when I was uh, working uh, as a buyer at the health food store, I literally typed up the list of alternative doctors like Dr. Neil Bernard, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. These are all vegan doctors. They know about nutrition, but back in my day, no. So um, it's amazing. We've got a lot of good information now. So this was written in uh, 2016, a year before Brie died. Uh, Brie is now 36 years old. She's still holding her own, creeping around the house, making her happy sounds and knowing what she wants and letting me know about it. She is healthy considering the involvement of her deletion, not even having a cold in several years. I have maintained the foundations of what was set up during the 20 years. We still practice a microbi macrobiotic plant-based lifestyle and she is still creeping around the house every day. 
the plant-based diet and what we learn from the Institutes for the Achievement of Human Potential have been and continue to be vital in raising Brie. Of course, there have been changes. As my knowledge grows, I tweak things here and there. I have added green smoothies, more raw foods to our diet, and I do the parts of the stimulation program that I can manage. Brie only sees a doctor once a year for her annual checkup, which is required by the local um, Health and Human Services Agency. I am a single mom and have been most of this journey with Brie since she was 11. Uh, I have been, it has been hard financially more than anything else, along with the stress and anxiety that comes with that. Uh, yes, Brie means full 24 seven care, and that level of care is very demanding, yet Brie is a joy. She is just this pure, beautiful soul who never has a negative thought. Depending on me to keep her safe. That was my, you know, like me, <laughs> you know, I, I'm supposed to keep her safe, you know, and um, I took that seriously, you know, it scared the daylights out of me, you know, but I took it seriously. <laughs> I had said many times that Brie is not the problem. The system we live in is the problem. Yes, there have been a great deal of stress whenever Brie is feeling off or coming down with something. A large part of that stress comes from knowing that I have to figure out how to help her myself. Because if I take her to a doctor, they will prescribe a drug, drug of some kind that will devastate her in some way. I will never forget the time the doctor gave her seizure medication that was too strong for her, and he put her into respiratory distress. Just this morning, Bree woke up feeling cranky, looking a bit green and sweaty. The old feeling of fear and helplessness still pop up, wondering what is this about? Then I go back to my basics, uh, some aspirin suppositories, kuzu drink, uh, I make up the kuzu drink, and within a half an hour, Brie is making her happy sounds. I still absolutely hate it when Brie is not feeling her best. It is the feeling of helplessness. Will I be able to handle this? Will I make the right decision? What if she dies? And I hated that she would, she would be in pain. She cannot tell me what it is and is relying on me to make the best decision. Even with this sort of stress with Brie, it is small compared with fighting for services and financial support. The bottom line of why that is in our society is because Brie, people like my daughter are just not valued in this society. Our society looks upon them as a burden. Our society values people who are young, they sing and dance or act. Generally, that's you know what makes them popular. One has to have a job. There is no value in the dignity of caring for a disabled person. What I have learned during the almost 40 years of raising Brie is priceless. It is an experience like no, wonder, no other. And the interesting thing is that no one wants, and that no one wants to be me. <laughs> you know, they're glad they're not me. <laughs> during this time, I have fed, dressed, done her hair, brushed her teeth, cut her toenails, fingernails, bathed, cooked for, crept with, read to, massaged, walked, fed, nursed through sicknesses and changed thousands of diapers, actually, I don't know, thousands, thousands and thousands, and loved my girl. Yet that is nothing compared to what Bria's done for me. And continues to do for me daily. By caring for Bria, she has saved me. She has made me over. I'm a better human being because I cared for her. The diet I've chosen to provide for my daughter myself has and is crucial to our long-term health and well-being. It was that without a doubt why Brie is still alive and healthy and medication free. The saying, you are what you eat, says it all. What you put into our mouth becomes our powerful biological response modifier, changing the way the body works. The body given the raw materials it needs, plant-based organic foods, is able to heal itself. This is a subject I will cover at another time. Um, how does a parent of a special needs child not only survive, but manage to continue to care for and support a totally dependent child their whole life? 
the financial challenges, health challenges, emotional challenges, and spiritual challenges. These are things that I hope to, to write more about. So, you know, I'm thinking, first of all, I really believe Brie would still be here if I knew about Ion Gut Support. Brie passed away because her gut, intestines, gut, stomach, were backing up on her kidneys and shutting them down. Okay. And in retrospect, you know, I saw things going on, but I didn't know. I didn't have uh, anything to relate it to. So that was happening. And she passed peacefully. You know, four days before she passed, we were creeping around the house together. But I had been, I knew something was off. You know, you could look back and you see this. But if I had a head eye on gut help, which repairs the tight junctions in your gut, you know, Brie was constipated for the first 30 years of her life. And I managed it with suppositories daily. I also managed it, you know, when I found out about green smoothies, that really helped. And more raw foods, that really helped. But, you know, I'm always, it's always like I'm trying to catch up uh, on the knowledge and what's going on and what I can do for her. And, you know, I'm I'm the everything. I'm the, the caregiver, the researcher, the, you know, trying to know what's best and what's not. So, but I know, but I didn't know about that. If I had have known about that when that was first formulated in 20, on the market in 2012, that five years would have given me enough time to repair her gut. So it would have been functioning because what was happening is the, the little waves of fibers in your gut that pushes, pushes the toxins, the, you know, what comes out of us, out of us wasn't working with Brie. There was nothing working there. So nothing was pushing. That could have gotten repaired with this good, you know, I, I really believe it. I really believe it. That's, you know, I, that's why I get passionate about it. I have a, I put a video on it because, you know, I, I'd love everybody to, uh, you know, it's, it's a protection against colds and flus and stuff because when your tight junctions in your body are working, it keeps out toxins, but it, you absorb your nutrients better. So, but it is what it is. Um, you know, you can't, the what ifs, you know, I, I can't do anything about what ifs. But the last thing um, I'll end with is, uh, I don't know, about a year before Brie passed, uh, Walter, uh, Walter had been fighting me. Her father had wanted to do nothing and be fighting me a year in court. And at the same time, that's when I first, I think that's when I first started the YouTube because I knew that we, I had to make our story public. You have to, to be seen or, you know, a mom with a spider, they, you just get, you could just get pushed under the rug. It is a constant struggle for, for services that you actually need. I could have gotten a lot of stuff that would have cost, you know, government tax, but I didn't need them for her. You know, I needed creeping. I knew the stimulation program that worked. I knew what I needed. I didn't need, you know, sitting does not get you to walk. You know, creeping and crawling get you to walk eventually. So um, there was uh, an issue with the rental car. I guess Walter hadn't, uh, it was being used in New Hampshire, but I guess he hadn't told his insurance company. So, um so what happened was he calls me up and I guess the insurance company says, you have to get this, this car back. I've got a, a big hundred dog, hundred pound Luna just walked in to say hi, didn't you, honey? And um, so she's not my dog. <laughs> so what happened was uh, he had to take the car back to Vermont. So he had to come and... Uh, and I would be without a car. You know, I live in the country. I've lived in the country with Brie most of her, all, really all of her life. And uh, so I'm without a car and he has to take it back. He'd been fighting me for a year. At the same time, the uh, Community Bridges, which is one of the local agencies, had been fighting me trying to withdraw a stipend that paid for our food. And they wanted me, that's how it started. They, they said I'd have to give up guardianship of Brie to continue the stipend. I mean, this is, 
This is giving up the rights to speak for your child. So I had both of these people, you know, her father and this for a year. I had a legal aid lawyer and I had um, uh, legal, a disabilities rights lawyer. And I had a, a pro bono lawyer, one on each, you know, supporting me. Uh, but the stress constantly. So Walter has to do this and he comes to pick up the car. And I ask him, could, could he drive me to do, get a few things done because I was going to be without a car. So I needed to go to the mail. I needed a couple of things like that. And I had to pick up something at the pharmacy and it cost like $40. And I come out into the car and I said, you know, Walter, this isn't covered what I just got. And that's $40. I think it was special support suppositories for her. I said, that's not covered. And then I took the opportunity because I had never been alone with him. Like either, you know, he, he when uh, any visits he came, he was in and out. I have to go. Didn't have to go anywhere, but he had to go. He didn't stay. I mean, literally 10 minute visits, literally. And he could have come to the house. I would have left. He could have stayed there with his daughter. I would have whatever, but he did, wasn't interested. I always told him, you're always welcome. But that was an opportunity to tell him that I didn't leave him because I didn't love him. I told him I didn't, I left you because you weren't there. You were emotionally withdrawn from us. You weren't there for us anymore. I said, I, I don't hate you. I don't, it's not that I, it's none of that. But I, I told him, I said, you know, I'm responsible for Bree. This is your daughter. I'm responsible for her. She didn't ask for this. She can't speak for herself. I'm responsible to fight for her and fight for her life. He was quiet. He said, I understand. He didn't say anything. And, but I let, I wanted him to know that because that's the last time I've actually spoke. Well, I spoke to him. He did show up at the funeral. And then um, we got home and he wasn't going to come in. He wasn't going to come in and see Bree. And I said, you know, his, his wife was waiting in the car. And I said, well, why don't you come in and say hi to her? And, um, and I remember uh, he came in and Brie was sitting in this chair I bought for her. It was really nice. It was a rocking chair, but it was, a, it was a, a, like a living room chair too. And it, but it was rocking and it twisted around. So she loved it. She loved turning around and she loved being rocked. So we'd sit and rock in it and I'd read out loud to her. She was sitting there and there was a couch and Walter sat on the couch. The aide, Chris, my fantastic aide, was there and she was across the room and Brie literally reached out and held her dad's hand. And we both looked at each other, Chris and I, and we just, we went, my God. Because Brie would, when I'm sitting on the floor with her and we're watching TV together, she would like, you know, play with my hair and stuff like that, you know. But to reach out and hold someone's hand, she would do clapping hand games with you. So, but that was like something. And actually what passed in my mind is, you know, Walter, who used to be this, on the Canadian B team for downhill skiing, is now this obese man. It's, it's very, very sad. He was such a handsome young man, and now he, he was just this obese person. He looked more like her grandfather than her father. And uh, I thought, Bree's saying goodbye to him because he's going to pass. I thought he was going to pass away because he's just in such bad shape. Little did I know she was going to pass a year later. And he didn't see her before that. I mean, at that point, if he saw her once every seven years, it was quite something. Okay. So, um, so that, you know, that was the last time. But that night, he called me and he agreed. Because my requirement was you buy this rental car for us so that, you know, if you're pulling out on everything, I need a car. He agreed after a year of fighting and disagreeing. And, but you know, my lawyer kept saying, look at the videos, you know? So I went video, I went on the videos. The only reason I went on YouTube was because I needed to be visible. So he couldn't just, you know, literally, you know, his lawyer could see the video. 
<laughs> you know, literally, you know, he couldn't hide. You know, he couldn't hide what was going on. So he agreed. And uh, so it ended up his responsibility from then on. He had bought the car. And the only other responsibility he had was to pay for a, a teeth, her Bree's teeth cleaning twice a year. That was down to what oh, the only responsibility he had. So, um, so then hopefully, I mean, because it's a long story. It's a 37 year story. And there were so many challenges, so many, but a lot of miracles. Oh, I know what I'll finish with. One minute. The people in the back who I thanked, there's a couple of people I have to mention. And I've got recommended uh, books that, you know, to read. First of all, I thank my mother-in-law and my mom, both awesome, awesome, awesome. Then the 26 women in, uh, in this little ski village who did the uh, patterning program with us. Then I mentioned Han Selye. Actually, it's H-A-N-S-S-E-L-Y-E. -S -S -E. uh, I thanked my neighbor. When Brie was born, she turned out to be the mother-in-law of Hans Salye and brought me a copy of his book, Stress Without Distress. I mean, I'm headed into a life of stress and distress. And this woman, when Brie's born, brings me a copy of this book. Um, I mean, miracles, you know. Little did I know at the time how much his work would mean in my life. She would also babysit Brie. Uh, one of my first angels. Then uh, macrobiotic teachers, Mary Kett, the whole Cushy, Evelyn, uh, and uh, Micho Cushy, who introduced ma uh, macrobiotics to North America. Thank God for them. Uh, the Institutes for the Achievement of Human Potential, uh, all that stuff. Thank God, Glenn Doman, for the work they did. These people all changed our lives for the better. They gave us, gave Brie. 37 years on the planet. Uh, then the woman I moved in with in New Hampshire, the Tuttle family, oh my God, gave us a safe place. Then for eight years, Zunk and Beth Bunker, Zunk Bunker. One day when I was out walking in uh, the town we lived in, Bree's in the stroller and Zunk drove up. He has since passed. He drove up beside us, got out and asked, who is helping you? And here I am, I'm all proud because, you know, I'm shopping at thrift stores, but I'm getting name brand products for like nothing, you know, name brand clothes and be able to clothe Brie and I, and I'm going, oh, you know, and I told him, I said, I get health and human services, I get this and this and, you know, SSI for Brie. And this is an amazing story. This guy saved us for eight years. So he was a busy guy. Actually, he was one of the um, managers for um, Aerosmith. And Brie actually met Steven Tyler. Yes, uh, Steven Tyler. Uh, <clears throat> I was outside the health food store one day and I was there with Brie and he came up and he was talking to her. He's a really nice man and I got to meet him later when I was working at the health food store, uh, he'd come in and he, I hopefully, I think he remembered, he appeared to remember Brie. Well, she's pretty unforgettable anyway. So um, always had good communication with him. When he came in, I always turned him on to the good stuff, you know? So um, Zunk used to be a, like a manager for bands and stuff. And so he knew, he knew Steven Tyler. They grew up in the same area and everything. So he's a busy guy, you know, he was raising money for public radio and so he told me to call him and I call him and busy and I don't like to interfere or bother people, but he kept telling me to call him back. And at that point, my rent was $700 a month. That was back in the day. Wow. And um, all of a sudden a check comes in the mail for $500 and it's from Zunk. And I'm going, well, thank you. I'll phone him and thanked him. And he said, we got to get together and have coffee and da, 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 da. But he's always busy. I didn't. So the next month, a check for 700 comes. And I'm going, this is my rent. He doesn't know my rent, you know. So I phoned him and I said, well, why? He said, I don't know. Just came into my head. And every check it had, the memo was 
the, my sacrificial angel. And uh, he did that for eight years, eight years. He paid our rent, got me through, got us through, all through. You know, allowed me, you know, some peace of mind, definitely. Until there, there was a market crash, but listen, I was, I was very, very thankful. So why he had met me originally, I was taking Brie for network chiropractic. And so there are about six people in the room at the same time, and Brie was on the table, I was on the table. And, and he was, and he asked me about Brie. And I told him, and I don't know where this came from. I said, she's really saved me. She, there was a story that I'd read probably because I was reading all the time that um, an angel had done her work and was about to go on and heard a call for help. The angel was free. The call was from me and came back and so felt the same way that she had saved him. I had people stop me and say they had seen Brie and I out walking and they had been caring for their wife or husband, feeling bad, and they saw us. <clears throat> they said they felt better. They thanked us, stopped us and thanked us. Thank you for what you're doing because you made my day better. You know, they didn't feel alone in what they were doing. So it was an amazing journey. So that, you know, those stories, there's so many stories like that. Uh, just impossible situations that happened. Marcel Vogel, I told you about how he came into my life. Uh, the people we rented a house from for 20 years, they gave it to me at a price I could afford and I would make sure it was well kept, you know, uh, I always made sure it was looked after. Uh, the town where we lived in, the, the on-scene support, uh, uh, where I got my taxes done, the guy says, if people don't see you guys out, because there was a, one summer, literally, a company gave me some uh, uh, rug runners, and I made a whole creeping place out on the front lawn so Bree would get fresh air and we'd be outside creeping. So the town really got to see us. And uh, and I love doing that. I wish, but I was doing everything alone. So things in and out six times a day, creeping her around, carrying her in and out. I mean, things like that. At the end of a uh, three months of summer, you know, you're you're wasted. You're tired. I didn't have anybody helping me with it. Um, but the town kept this. They all knew where we were. I mean, I didn't know the people. They knew me as Bree's mom, but like the police knew where we were. The fire department knew where we were. They all knew where we were. I mean, there was a time when uh, where we lived caught on fire and uh, we had to move out uh, because a plumber was doing a repair and caught the house on fire when he was using a, a blow torch. I mean, these there's on and on amazing stories that, you know, it's just there's a lot that goes on in 37 years. We got through it all, uh, but the biggest struggles were always uh, financial. And and to this day, you know, now that Bree has passed, you know, I, you know, I, I guess, you know, I had a purpose for 37 years. And since I was 17, I wanted to do something of value and I got to do it. Most valuable thing I can think of is making sure another human being is safe, loved and wanted. And, um, so, you know, then Brie passes and, you know, my purpose is gone. I have no idea what to do. And, um, you know, I've moved like over 10 times in five years. And during some of those moves, many moves. So, uh, you know, I'm living with friends. Um, I still don't know, you know, where my home base should be. Uh, the whole COVID thing has been insane. And, um... So, you know, I'm a, a U.S. citizen and I'm a Canadian citizen, um, but I'm not sure, uh, you know, I'm really, you're really putting me in a place of trust. I don't even know, you know, what, 
you know, I'm doing jobs here and there, but, um, you know, I'm still trying to make a living, uh, you know, a, a affordable living to pay rent and look after myself. Uh, thank God for Brie. Thank God for being, you know, on this healthy diet because of her. Thank God for being pushed into my spiritual life. You know, so I do daily meditations and uh, I'm always, you know, I'm doing this neurocycling now by Dr. Leaf. Uh, I'm reading The Course in Miracles. I walk. You know, I still have my dog troubles. Getting old, though, you know. Um, and I'm still finding out new information, and that's what I share with people. Uh, you know, there's a way to protect us against all the insanity going on health-wise. I be believe ion is a base of that. I believe a spiritual life is really, really important. I'm not talking religion. I'm talking spiritual. Uh, we're all energy. You know, I believe in positive. We're all energy. I believe in healing. You know, the old patterns we have from our child, negative patterns, toxic thoughts from our childhood. So, um, you know, there's a great deal of hope. There's so many people working to heal the environment. I don't listen to the news. I don't think it's going anywhere. I don't think politics is going anywhere anymore. All they're doing, it's, it's just uh, talking heads. Um, you know, but there are a lot of people that are doing really great you know the fact that coke is being allowed even allowed to be sold the fact that uh you know roundup roundup has commercials on tv that should be criminal glyphosate which is what's in roundup destroys your gut lining where your immunity is where your serotonin is where your dopamine is you know that should be illegal so we live in a world where you know the politicians and the one percent are making a ton of money you know wars you know wars uh because we have a huge industry of making uh, tanks and guns and bombs you know and so they have to create wars and it's interesting they create wars in countries that have resources that they're interested in before this local a local war happened there were politicians investing in in the military industry the weapons industry they were investing stocks into that you know that's the insanity that's going on you know foods that are allowed to be marketed chemicals that are allowed to be marketed like put this on your lawn you know uh that stuff put brie into seizures that stuff my dogs would throw up you know, you don't see it, but uh, when you see lawns with the little yellow signs on telling you, they hide them in the corner because they have to legally put what has been sprayed. 2D4, that's a part of the Agent Orange chemical. And they spend, put it on lawns in communities. New London, a local community where Brie and I spend a lot of time. I'm not there now, but they, I see it springtime. You know, they're spraying it. So, uh, but there are people that are doing good stuff. And those are the people to get involved with. Those are the people to support. Um, you know, there's great hope. Regenerative farming, you want to support something like that. Farmersfootprint.org, dot US, farmersfootprint.us. You know, these are people that are working to uh, regenerative farming to bring our soils back. Our soils can come back within a year, but we can't wait forever to do this. You know, the earthworms will come back in a year. Um, so, you know, nature is very forgiving if we would stop what we're doing. Uh, I will do a video uh, soon about just uh, products in your home that you can change out and, and, you know, invest. Invest in our future by investing in non-toxic products. So, um, so I still have a passion to, uh, I want Brie to be proud of me, you know, and... Uh, most of everything I do is to honor her legacy. And I hope I'm doing it. And I hope that, you know, people will be inspired. You know, uh, greatest gift, hard, tough, but greatest gift is caring for uh, our animals and our people uh, who depend on us. Innocence, you know, they depend on us to, uh, and the earth depends on us to stop doing the insanity stuff we're doing. So, I want to uh, thank you so much 
And uh, so this is the last of the thank you for uh, for uh, being on the channel and um, uh, and listening to Bree's story. Thank you. Until the next time.